How's it going, Century Martial Arts? My name is Jackson Rudolph with Team Paul Mitchell Karate and founder of the Flow Weapons Training System. And today, instead of doing some of the cool bow tricks and spins that I normally teach, today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about uh, traditional weapons in competition. So I want to uh, go ahead and point out one very important difference here. And it's that some tournaments and leagues are going to require traditional weapons forms uh, that are taught in your system, right? It's going to be a very specific set of rules. You're going to want to be competing with that specific form that you learned in your style for those closed tournaments, closed circuits, things like that. And you absolutely should not alter those forms for those types of leagues and those types of tournaments. However, many of the open circuits, NASCA, NBL, and others, encourage the use of forms that may be created by the practitioner, by the competitor, but that use only uh, and exclusively traditional movements. And so today what we're going to be talking about is when you are competing in those open leagues and those open tournaments where you can alter your traditional weapons forms a little bit, what are some ways that you can take your traditional bow form to the next level? So if you are competing in closed circuits with very traditional rules that require a specific type of form, absolutely, you want to abide by those rules, don't make any modifications, and just try to perform those traditional skills to the best of your ability. The things that we're going to talk about today and the upgrades, the ways that you can add difficulty to a traditional bow form, what we're going to talk about today is modifications for open competition. And that can mean that you create your own routine from scratch using only traditional movements, or it could mean that you take maybe a traditional bow form that you learned in your style and you add some modifications to make it more competition friendly. And this has been something that's very common in Korean, Japanese styles in the open circuit competition for many years now. So once again, if it's closed circuit, closed rules, do exactly what those rules tell you. But what we're going to talk about today is for those open leagues. So one of the first things that I want to talk about is diversifying your form. You want to make sure that there's a lot of different elements contained in your form. One of the things that can limit a form that comes from a very traditional curriculum is that oftentimes traditional forms have a theme, right? You'll turn to the right, do a certain set of techniques, maybe it's an up, down, side, side one way, and then you find some way to transition, come back to the left, and then it's the same combination of techniques on the other side. When you are competing in open circuits and have the ability to modify or make up your own traditional weapons performances, one advantage that you have over some of those traditional style forms is that you can mix it up. Instead of having to do just an up, down, side to side or a four corners combination on one side, when I change direction, I can switch that up. Maybe I can switch my stance, do an over the head strike combination first, then come back with an up strike and retreat. So it doesn't have to necessarily mirror both sides like a lot of uh, true traditional forms tend to. So it's important to have creativity, but maintain the creativity within a traditional foundation. I've seen some crazy things that people do in what are supposed to be traditional bow forms. I've seen people go for hand rolls. I've seen people go for neck rolls. These are things that in any league that I know of, any tournament that I know of, you do not want to be doing in a traditional weapons division. If you're in a traditional weapons division, you should only be doing things that are applicable to combat and have some type of relation to traditional weapons. But that does not mean that you can't add some difficulty to your performance using some of those uh, concepts. So the first one that we're gonna talk about today is what's called a knee spin. A knee spin is what I consider to be an essential move in any traditional bow staff form in particular on the open circuits because judges have come to expect it. It's kind of one of those staple moves where the, the judges are checking off their boxes like, okay, they can do this, they have this skill, they've mastered this technique. And so it's just one of those things that even though it's common, it shows difficulty in your form through balance and control. And a lot of judges are looking for it. So it can be, if you can do a good one, it shows a good strong point of comparison between you and your other competitors. So how does the knee spin work? You can transition into the knee spin from any striking combo that you want to. All you have to do is collapse the back leg. So let's say that I'm in a right leg front stance. I'm doing some striking combination just like so. And all I have to do to get to my knee is I just drop to the knee as I bend, uh, bend that left knee, do an over the head strike, boom. I'm on my knee and I'm ready to operate from this position. Now what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna come up to the camera and try to angle this down just a little bit so you guys might be able to get a little bit better view of this. That should be a little bit better. I might just have to back up a little bit more. You might be catching a little bit of my, uh, the bottom of my computer there, but that's okay. 
Um, so anyway, so this left leg is going to collapse onto the ground, and I'm on my knee, right? And going to the knee is, been, is a very useful level change, right? There's nothing that's traditionally inaccurate about doing this, right? If you were going to talk about combat application, maybe it's a situation forms. are supposed to be situations with multiple attackers, right? So sometimes the, 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 ideolo the ideology would be that I'm striking, I'm attacking an opponent on this side, an opponent comes from here, takes out my back leg, right, with like a low kick or a round kick, something like that takes out my back leg, I'm forced to drop to the knee, and so typically what you'll see is immediately after dropping to the knee, you'll switch sides and come back the other way, and you're not gonna stay on the knee very long. You're gonna be transitioning to standing back up because that is the position you want to be in. In combat, you would very rarely willingly go down to your knee to continue the, uh, to continue the fight. So if you do go to the knee, it's gonna be for a very short period of time, and now we're gonna add that little element of creativity by showing you how you can add some difficulty to your traditional weapons form for open circuit competition with the knee spin. I've got the right leg in front. I'm gonna collapse this left knee down. Let's say I do an over the head strike. Boom, so I just transition from my front stance to the knee. And what you wanna do here is you wanna maintain control. I see some people try to push off on their knees and like pivot as if they were spinning on one foot where you just kinda of push off and spin like this. That is not the technique that you wanna use when you are on your knees trying to spin. What you want to do is two steps. Step one, and don't even worry about your weapon right now, just focus on the footwork. Step one, I'll scoot back a little bit more so you can see me. Step one is, this right knee is gonna come across, I'm gonna turn halfway around and have both knees on the ground. Boom, just like so. And then step two is I pick this left knee up and that turns me the other 180 degrees to the front. This helps me maintain balance and control as I'm doing the spin technique. I'm never just balancing on one knee or the other because I would be losing control in that situation. So once again, the right knee is up. I'm gonna bring the right knee down to the ground and then trade off lifting my left knee up. Right knee down, one. Step two, left knee up, boom. So now the question becomes, what is the bow doing while I'm executing this technique? Most of the time, you're actually gonna execute a sweeping technique going into an uppercut at the end. So now we're gonna add in the bow work. We're gonna say that I was in a right leg front stance doing some striking combination. I drop to the knee, right? Now from this position, I'm gonna take this right hand, I'm gonna bring it all the way back behind me. So I'm dropping that right hand all the way back to my backside, I'm in my chamber, and I want that right arm fully extended. Because as I come across the front here, that's gonna make a sweeping motion. If this elbow's bent, that's gonna be weak. I want a nice fully extended right arm. I'm gonna do the first half of my turn. You can see the bow's gonna come sweeping across the front as I do the first half. And then as I do the second half, I bring that bow to the front and then finish with that uppercut. Then from this position, like I said, you're never gonna wanna be on the knee very long, so you would come back up, transitioning into some type of standing combination. So once again, to summarize the knee spin technique, you're starting from a standing position, as you should be in a front stance. You can transition just by dropping that left knee with the over the head strike, big strong chamber back, You'll push off that right leg, and then both knees down, and then the left knee comes up. Full speed, it'll look like this. <clears throat> so executing that full spin on the knees, showing control, showing balance, adding a little bit of difficulty to a traditional weapons routine to help you take it to the next level again for competition purposes, right? A lot of the things, as I readjust the camera here to bring it back up some, a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about as we try to upgrade difficulty of a traditional weapons form is gonna border on the lines between traditional and creative. Is it practical and applicable to combat? Is it not, right? And the idea is, is that you wanna to try to keep it as applicable as possible. You don't wanna do anything that's just preposterous, right? You don't wanna do anything that you would just never ever do in combat. So when you go to the knee, it's only going to be for a very short period of time. You'll never do like an entire third or an entire section of your form from that knee position. You get to the knee, do what you gotta do, get back to your feet as quickly as possible, and then continue executing the rest of the board. Now, the next way that we can add some difficulty to a traditional weapons form is what's called a balance move. And balance move is yet another one where we're not really gonna be doing something that is directly applicable to combat while we're in the move, but consider it like a ready stance, right? So let's say at the very beginning of my form, a lot of traditional bow forms, even real traditional bow forms from traditional styles, as well as contemporary traditional bow forms, start in this position, right? Oftentimes the left hand will come up over the top and grab the bow just like this, and then you'll start by stepping back into a block, stepping forward into a forward strike, 
a lot of different things like that. So this is a very common position. But this position in and of itself does not do anything. This is just a ready stance. It's a fighting stance. It's a fighting stance because it's what we call offensive position where I've got the bow in front of my arm to show that you don't want to fight, that you're being defensive. You're going to put the bow on the back side. This is what we call defensive position for the beginning of a form. But anyway, even if I'm in offensive position, this position in and of itself doesn't do anything, right? I'm not using this position in combat. This is my ready stance. Then from here, I can attack figure eight forward strike, or I can defend stepping back and blocking. So I have options. It's just a ready stance. When we talk about balance moves and implementing balance moves into a traditional weapons form for competition, the balance moves are going to be some form of a ready stance in the middle of the routine. So here's how a balance move works. I'll teach you the technique and then I'll teach you kind of what the, uh, what the idealistic uh, practical application of the technique would be. So here's what the technique looks like. The most basic version is to just go from a right leg in front, front stance, going straight to your target, we'll say with a forward strike. And most of the time when doing a balance move, you're going to want to execute a block technique. So the way this will work is my right hand will come up high to the shoulder and then slide all the way back to the hip. Once I get that bow back to the hip, I'm ready to go into my block position. I lift my right knee up and holding the balance move right here. I'm going to hold this for two or three seconds before exploding back into another high speed striking combination. That's one important tip is that you never want to be doing a slow move followed by another slow move, right? So when I'm doing these traditional weapons routines, I want to show explosiveness. So when I set this up, I'm going to want to be going from a high speed striking combination here and then taking my time to set up the balance move and then exploding into another high speed combination the second that I finish up that technique. So once again, the right leg's in front. Let's say I'm executing a forward strike. My right leg is gonna slide back to my left. My right hand comes back to my right hip. And then all in one motion, I lift the knee up, showing off the balance, two or three seconds, and then exploding back into it, right? So the practical application of that would be, you know, I've done some combination, I've engaged with an opponent, I finish them off, maybe that forward strike is the big finishing move, right? And then I think that everything's chilled out for a second, and so I retreat up on one leg. Uh, now, granted, you wouldn't want to be up on one leg in your ready stance, you know, because somebody can knock you off balance, things like that. But in a perfect world, the idea behind doing this is that in that position, I'm ready to either step out and throw the bow staff strike, or notice it's a chamber. I don't just have my knee up for no reason. It's a chamber. So from this position, I can choose to throw that front kick and then execute more bow staff techniques from there. Now, when you perform this, you typically won't want to perform it just being stationary, pick your knee up, and then continue back in the same direction. You're normally going to use this upgrade, this difficulty technique, you're typically gonna use it to change direction. So it's not just about lifting the leg up, but it's also about being able to pivot. Most of the time you'll see this be a 90 degree turn, but I have seen people do a 180 degree turn. The more that you turn, obviously, the less traditional, the less foundational that it gets but you may be trading that off to show the judges extra difficulty and show them extra skill. Let's all keep in mind that forms were really created for two reasons, right? Number one reason is that they were simulated as uh, combat with multiple attackers, right? It's a simulated series of self-defense technique. But the other purpose for it was to develop cardio, to practice technique, to work on precision, to, to work on all of those intangibles about being a martial artist. You do that to improve your execution. And so if I can do something to show off that I have good balance, if I can do something to show off that I have good coordination, good leg strength, those are things that even though I may not use in combat, they are still good things to show off even in a traditional form. And that's exactly what we're doing right now. So now we're going to talk about this direction change. We're going to use the 90 degree example because that's the most common. Let's say that I start to the front now, same idea, right leg's in front, I'm executing the forward strike. I can bring this right leg back to my left, my right hand can come all the way back to that right hip, exact same setup, and then I bring this knee up in the air. Now once I'm showing off that balance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to push off of the ball of my left foot so that I can turn on my heel and come to the side, just like that, turning 90 degrees, and then I can explode into a strike combo going in another direction. You can also make that a little bit more dynamic by having that first balance move go more to the left side, so I balance this way and then I make my turn to the right, and then I execute my technique. But again, that 90 degree turn is what's gonna be most common. And the way that I have found most efficient, I'll say this again because it may have seemed subtle when I broke it down the first time, is you know, I've got that left foot down. What I wanna do is I'm gonna push off the ball 
of my left foot. The ball is going to act, so this is my foot, right? The front part, the fingers here are the ball of the foot. I want to lift that ball of the foot up just for a moment to let my heel pivot and rotate out. And then as soon as the ball goes back down, I regain balance, and that's the position that's going to allow me to not stumble or not lean one way or the other during my technique. So yes, you are going on your heel, but it's only for a brief second so that you can get turned and then your ball brings back the stability. So once again, I've got that right knee up and I'm gonna make my turn by lifting the ball of my foot up, turn on the heel, ball of the foot goes back down, I make my stop and then I can continue off to the other direction. So once again, we're going from a forward strike position. The right hand's gonna come back to my right hip. I bring the knee up, I'm holding that block position out nice and strong. Pivot, hold that for a second, and then go. As far as timing and pacing goes, because timing and pacing is extremely important for any traditional bow routine, if you are going to do the pivot, you're probably going to want to hold the second position after the turn a little bit longer than you hold the first position. Because you want to show off that you don't just turn and fall out of the balance move, but you want to show that you can turn, maintain your balance, and then continue, right? So I lift the knee up, and then boom. Now here's where I hold. One, two, figure eight, back into my striking combination. Now there is one more transition out of the balance move that I really like. It's a little bit more fast paced and would have a little bit more practical application. And that's the jump switch to the strike. So once again, let's say I've got this right knee up in the air. I'm holding this balance move. Now what I can do is keeping this knee as still as possible. I wanna start a figure eight down to the right, over to the left. And as this rolls over into a forward strike, I'm gonna switch my knees, showing off more balance, showing that I can balance on each of my legs. So, from this position, figure eight, jump switch to the forward strike. And notice the left knee has come up, and now I can step back into an over the head, spin into a different combination. I have a lot of different options. Now for this one, it's not like the pivot. With the pivot or the 90 degree turn, I wanna go shorter pause here, longer pause after the transition. But for this jump switch technique, I'm going to want to hold the first position longer so that I can get right back into striking as soon as I jump switch. So I would show off my balance here, figure it switch, and then very quickly exploding into that next striking combination. So once again, to show you the jump switch technique, the right knee is up. We're pretty much always gonna be holding out this defensive block here because this is a ready stance. Now from this position, right hand pulls back first. I start my figure eight. When it gets to my left, that's when I start bending that left knee. That's when I start loading my jump. When the bow gets to my left side, I load that left knee and then jump switch. The left knee comes up. I lock out that forward strike and I can continue on to the front. So the balance move, even though you probably wouldn't use it in combat, it's a great way to show off balance, show off coordination. And if you were to use it in combat, it's considered a ready stance, right? I'm in a defensive blocking position. The knee is raised so I can execute the front kick if I need to, or I can just step down and go straight in to the striking combination covering distance. Now, at the beginning of this, I mentioned that there were some crazy things I've seen people do in traditional weapons. I've seen people try neck rolls. I've seen people try hand rolls. I've seen people try a bunch of different crazy stuff. But there's a reason for that. And it's because people are always trying to find ways to give themselves a competitive edge, right? Some way to get an advantage over the others by modifying their traditional routine. However, it's important to remember that you're ne you never want to modify with a move that is going to take the bow out of your control, right? When I do a hand roll, I'm losing control of the weapon while it's on the back of my hand, and then I'm making the catch. When I do a neck roll, I'm losing control of the weapon while it's on my neck, and then I make the catch. It's essentially no different than if I had thrown my bow in the air and caught it, which we all know you would never ever do in a traditional weapons routine. However, there are some ways that you can show a little bit of flash and a little bit of flare and show off your speed and some difficulty keeping the bow in your control the entire time and using some foundational principles of traditional martial arts. One of these techniques is the double-double, right? As many of you may know, the figure eight began as a Chinese traditional striking technique. Bow staff was first created in ancient China. Uh, ancient Chinese farmers would use these long wooden sticks to carry the buckets of water, water their crops, uh, so on and so forth. 
when they would have to defend themselves from bad guys like the Mongolian imperialists, what they would have to do is, is they would have to put one bucket of water down, followed by the other, and then strike over the top with that figure eight technique, most likely coming down to the collarbone, and then you could repeat striking over and over again. It's a foundational concept in Chinese martial arts, Kung Fu, Wushu, etc., and that's how Bo Staff got started. As the Mongols continued their reign uh, on through China into Korea and Japan, that's where you get different offshoots of Bo Staff, Taekwondo styles, which are rather uncommon, and then the more common Japanese karate-based styles of Bo Staff. So anyway, the figure eight technique is a great way to show some speed and some flair, but there's another way you can take that to the next level, and that's by adding a spin to it with the double-double. Now when you do a figure eight for a traditional weapons form, one common mistake that I see, unless this is what your traditional form specifically calls for, is I see people doing a whole bunch of it, right? You'll go from strike, and then you'll just figure eight, and then eventually they'll spin, and then eventually they'll do their strike, right? We don't want it to happen that way. You want to be spinning for as little time as possible. You want to get back to the traditional martial arts combat techniques. So when you finish that figure eight, Get the spin done, get onto your striking, and show off the speed and the power of the striking, not of the spinning. So when you do this, it's just gonna be two figure eights. I figure eight once to the front, another time as I spin, and then I execute my strike, and that's how we do the double-double. Now, an important teaching tip for any instructors watching this. There's two ways you can teach a double-double, or this spinning figure eight technique. By the way, to my understanding, it's called a double-double because it's two double motions, right? A figure eight is one, two motions, and when I do a double-double, I'm going one, two, one, two, right? So two figure eights, two double motions as I'm spinning to complete the technique, or you can just call it a spinning figure eight. Anyway, two ways to teach it. The first way is the harder way and the way that I don't recommend, and it's the breakdown method, which we use to teach everything, right? So you could try to say, okay, we're going to bring the bow down to the right side. We're going to pick it up to the right shoulder. Now it's going to go down to the left hip. That's when I'm going to start my turn. I'm going to flip the bow over. You see how that starts to get really complicated really quickly. So that's why I don't like to teach it that way, especially when kids try to learn it that way. They get confused really quickly. Instead, what I like to do is make sure that people have their figure eight spin down. So say 30 seconds, everybody do their figure eights, just get those figure eights going. And then once everybody's comfortable with their figure eights, I just say on the count of three, let's spin together. One, two, three. Spin around in a circle, right? Now granted, it's not gonna look like that the first time that most people do it. It'll probably look something more like this, right? Where it's a little bit more out of control, there's a little bit of fear, so the arms go further away from the body. That's normal, but, that first version where at least the bow keeps moving, even if you're scared of it, is a whole lot better than a student that's doing this, right? And taking it one step at a time and being super robotic and it doesn't even resemble the move that it's supposed to be, right? So I like to teach it as just trust your figure eight and then we just add that spin to it. And one of the reasons that that starts to feel so awkward, and then this is the troubleshooting that you're gonna to wanna to do to help the students improve, or if you are a student, this is what you're gonna to wanna to be looking for to make sure that you don't do. And that is, after this first figure eight, when I come back to my left side, it's a very, very common feeling to feel this little catch right here, right? The bow's gonna kinda of like stop for a second as you make that transition to the next figure eight, and that is totally normal. No matter how fast you get at your double-double, I even feel a little bit of that catch to this day. Because what's happening is, is I'm switching from a forward figure eight, and for a moment, I do a little reverse figure eight right here. See that? My left hand dips underneath, my right hand scoops under. That is a reverse figure eighting technique. I'm doing that reverse figure eight for just about half of a motion right there before I turn and now I'm back into a normal figure eight, right? And it's that little bitty uh, reverse figure eight there, that little part of a reverse figure eight that makes that catch. So even when you see me do this technique full speed, I still feel, even though that may look smooth, I still feel when I get back here that little tiny catch right there. So again, and you can probably hear it just listening to the technique. If you can hear the whoosh of my bow, go ahead and turn up the volume on your device real quick. Listen, you'll hear two very distinct motions. Right? That's probably a horrible uh, onomatopoeia for it. But just go ahead and listen to the bow, right? Yeah, there's, very, there's two very distinct sounds there. And that is the first figure eight, I switch, and then the second figure eight, which finishes 
as I go back to the front, as I go back to my target. So it's totally normal to hear those two sounds. It's totally normal to feel that little catch in the middle of the move. What's important is that you just continue repping it so you can flow right through it. So once again, in slow motion, and if you do like the more detailed breakdown, here's how it goes. I start from just a regular figure eight. The bow comes down to my right side, right hand coming to my left hip. The right hand comes up over the top. And as the right hand crosses down to the left hip, this is where I'm gonna to start to turn my body. So when the right hand goes to the left hip, that's where I turn my body. Now my left hand is underneath this right arm. This is the little part that's a reverse figure eight. My left hand is now gonna lift up and my right hand scoops underneath. As that right hand scoops underneath, my right leg steps through and I turn my hips. Now I'm home free. I'm in regular thirds position. All I have left is this figure eight down to my left side and I can unwind directly into a forward strike aiming straight at the nose there at the front. By the way, I'm gonna break that double-double down one more time for you guys, but another thing that sometimes even instructors are a bit confused by when I say that we're striking for the nose on our forward strike is because, of course, the target for our strike is not gonna be at the nose, right? I'm not gonna to try to defend myself and try to hit somebody exactly right on the nose. That would probably hurt, but it's really hard to pull off exactly hitting somebody right on the nose, right? The reason that I always say that we're aiming for the nose Two principles. Number one, you're always going to continue through your target. Think about breaking, right? And breaking, we always talk about don't hit the board, hit through the board, right? So you always hit through your target. And the second principle, for the reason that I strike to the nose, is that most of the time, the correct forward strike target is going to be up here to the temple, right? There are two primary forward strike targets, the collarbone and the temple. The collarbone is more for if you want to disable your opponent, right? Not allow them to use that arm. It's not a lethal blow, but the collarbone is very easy to break. But the temple is what you're going to use if you're going for the knockout, a much more dangerous, much more deadly technique. You know, a fracture to the temple can cause uh, intracranial ble bleeding, a lot of really bad things that you probably don't want to cause unless it's a life and death situation. But anyway, so the idea of targeting the forward strike at the nose is that you'd be striking to the temple and you continue through the target. And if I'm hitting to my temple and I draw a line straight across continuing through, I end up right there on the nose. And so that's why I like to use that target a lot when I'm teaching the forward strike is boom, going straight through to the nose of that target. One more time, we're gonna break down the double-double. I'll show you one more way that you can take your traditional weapons forms for open circuits, open leagues, open tournament competition. I'll show you one more way that you can upgrade that, and then we'll be done here for this Technique Tuesday. So for the double-double, one more time. We start right hand going down to the right side, goes down to the right hip. My right hand's gonna come up over the top, and as my right hand goes down to the left, that's when I'm gonna start my rotation. So my right hand's going down to the left, I turn my hips to the back. My right hand is now gonna come up and underneath as I'm facing the front. When this right hand scoops under, my right leg steps through, Boom, now I'm almost there. I just finish off this figure eight on my left side and then continue through into the forward strike. So once again, that's a technique that you want to happen very, very quickly. You get the double-double done with and then you move on right back into those traditional striking combinations to show off your speed, power, and execution in your traditional bow form. Another way that you can kind of um, border on creativity, right? Bring in some things that look like spins, but really do have some striking application to them, is to use your swinging combinations, right? The traditional bow staff baseball swing, and one of the things that I don't like about this move is that a lot of people call it a baseball swing, because a really common mistake that I see is people will go from their ready stance, right? This is a ready stance. This doesn't mean that I'm swinging, it just means that I'm ready to swing, right? So my opponent knows that I'm ready to fight when I'm in this position. And a common mistake that I see is when people do their baseball swings, they'll swing like a baseball bat. They'll kind of drop their weight back on the right leg first, they'll start to level out the bow first, and then they'll complete their swing, right? Well, the problem with that is the second that I shift my weight back and the second that I drop this bow, now my opponent knows I'm not just ready to swing, I am swinging. And that's gonna be a very, very easy technique to block or get out of the way from, right? So what you wanna do is from this ready stance, for a martial arts baseball swing with your bow, you wanna make sure that there's no loading back on the right leg, there's no flattening the bow out, no. You go directly from point A to point B. I'm going from this position here, my bow does not level out until I am at my target. I'm using that same push-pull technique that I used to get the power 
on a side strike, I'm using that exact same push-pull now down at the bottom of my bow to make that swing happen. And you can still get a pretty good amount of power just using the rotation of the hips as you would for any other technique, as well as using that push-pull of the arms. So from this position, boom, I can swing through a nice straight line coming straight across the shoulders to make it look nice and pretty. Really, I'd be hitting up to the head or down to the ribs but I can go straight through my target, boom, extension. And even though my opponent knew that I was ready to swing, I didn't give away the fact that I am swinging by tilting my bow back, which is really important. But how do we turn this into something that upgrades the difficulty of your traditional weapons form? Well, it's all about combinations, right? So the first two swings that you'll do of this very popular combination to show off some difficulty and some control are basic swings. The first one's gonna be that regular forehand that I just demonstrated, boom, going across the front. The second, my right leg can step forward, I can execute another baseball swing going straight back to the other side. It's just a backhand, still good, clean, traditional technique there, nothing fancy. But then what we can do is we can add in a little bit of fancy manipulation here and maintain traditional striking. So what we do is, from here, you can actually tuck that bow, boom, down under that arm. You want it to be nice and tight, up under the armpit, where you're not gonna lose control of it. You want it all the way up under that armpit, tucked in nice and tight there. Notice my left hand does have to let go of the bow for that. So here's the back hand. My left hand's actually gonna push to help the bow rotate under faster. I tuck it straight under the arm. My left hand's right up here in fighting stance. As soon as I get that bow tucked, I'm gonna start spinning. I'm gonna spin my body around. This is gonna give me more rotational power when I go into my swing. You can think about it like a spinning hook kick, right? You can use a spinning hook kick in combat because the spin gives you more power. It's no different than when you're doing a spinning swing into a bow staff technique. So I've got the bow tucked. I'm gonna build up some rotational velocity by starting to spin. I can do what's called a parry block, very common with Eskrima and Kali styles. Do what's called a parry block by pulling this bow around my head, right? So let's say I had an attacker, you know, coming in with another weapon. They have an Eskrima, they have a bow, whatever. They're coming in with another weapon. I can tuck here, I can parry that weapon away, bringing that bow around my head once again. Not only is my body turning, but now my bow's rotating. So I've got two methods of rotational momentum, rotational velocity building up to go into the swing. So my body is spinning, my bow's coming around my body off the parry block, I spot to the front, there's two options here. A Little bit more creative would be to just go ahead and swing with the one hand, or you can also angle that coming down more on the collarbone. However, if you wanna keep it a little bit more traditional, you wanna make sure coming out of that parry block, you grab that bow right here with that left hand. Good, clean, two-handed technique going through to the swing and then finishing off with a powerful forward strike. You can bring that down into a parallel strike. You've got a couple of different options coming out of the baseball swing combination. So once again, the first two techniques of that combination are basic. I have my regular from my ready stance, not tilting back. From my ready stance, I unload with the forehand. I step through and throw the backhand. And then from here, my left hand pushes down to tuck the bow quickly under my arm. I turn. The right hand is gonna bring the bow around my head, throwing that parry block, hopefully deflecting something, but really just meant to build up some more rotational momentum. I'm building up that momentum as I come around. I regain control with the left, finish off that swing, carry that right through into the stepping forward strike or any technique or combination that you wanted to go in after that. So to review, if you are competing in traditional leagues that have well-defined rules about which weapons forms you are supposed to be performing, you're not gonna be using a tapered bow like this one. You'll probably be using one of the inch thick bows. This bow is an inch thick at the center, but it's tapered out for competitive purposes because that is the competitive standard. Don't hate the player, hate the game. Uh, but anyway, so uh, if you're competing in a traditional tournament, you'd probably be using a different looking bow and you would also most definitely be doing a traditional form from a style that you're not going to have modified. However, if you're competing in open competitions, I know there's a lot of virtual competitions going on right now. A lot of those rules are very, very loose. They mimic the rules of NASCA, NBL, other open leagues. Uh, and so you have a little bit of freedom with your traditional weapons routines to either make up your own only using traditional moves is the most important part, um, or you can take one of your traditional bow forms and you can modify it. And when you modify it, don't modify it to make it more creative. The key word here is difficult. We're not going to get a creative or an open bow form out of a traditional. We wanna maintain traditional principles, but add some athleticism, some difficulty, some extra things that are gonna give you a competitive advantage and show off your skills to the judges. 
To review a few of those things are showing control and agility by quickly dropping down to the knee to execute that sweeping knee spin. That shows great control, also leads to a nice big strong strike in the uppercut, immediately going back up to the feet. Another way that you can show that difficulty is by doing a variety of balance moves where I bring the knee up and balance. I can do a pivot to the side, like so, pivot, and then go on with my next combination, or I can jump switch, throwing that figure eight switch, and then I can go into another combination from there. And then the last way is to border on some creative ideas, but don't lose control of your weapon. Keep it traditional, right? We could use the figure eight, add the spin to it to show off some extra speed and control with the double-double, or we can take the basic traditional swinging combos, which by the way, are definitely the most effective for self-defense if you're just swinging as hard as you can. Tuck that bow under the arm, spinning to gain some more velocity, also shows off a little bit of flair, makes it look a little bit more difficult. You can finish up with a big swing and into the traditional strike. Now, the thing that I'll leave you with is uh, one of the coolest things that I think about my experience learning the bow is that I'm actually part of a competitive bow lineage that goes all the way back to the 80s as far as competition goes, starting with Mike Bernardo. Mike Bernardo is a Canadian martial artist, widely considered to be the father of modern bow staff. Mike Bernardo trained Casey Marks Nash, who many of you may know as a sport karate legend. Casey Marks Nash trained the current forms and weapons coach of Team Paul Mitchell, Lauren Carney, and Lauren Carney was my original bow staff instructor. So, I'm part of that lineage, and one thing that uh, started with uh, Shihan Bernardo is that what we always do at the end of our routines, at the end of our traditional weapons routines, is we'll finish it off like this, and I'm going to show you how we finish those traditional weapons routines today, and you still see this ending widely used across the circuit because of the influence of great competitors like Bernardo, Marks Nash, and Carney, and so the way that you're going to be finishing these routines is you'll typically start from, say, a left side strike. You'll do a big sweeping technique where the right hand comes up to the left shoulder. I'll sweep, bringing that bow up to the right shoulder as if I'm in a chamber for a forward strike. But instead, I'm gonna drop all the way down to my knee and do a big strike all the way down low, striking towards the ground. And then this is the pose that's probably gonna be familiar to those of you that are familiar with competition. We do an over the head strike low to the right side of the body. And then the left hand will come in. <sighs> Nice, good, strong, ready position with the left hand on the inside of the leg. And then you can show respect by bowing the head from that position. And then you clear with the ready stance up front. And then once again, showing respect with the bow there. So that's just one of the signature endings that's part of my lineage of learning bow that I wanted to share with you all. Um, it's something that's been uh, very popular in competition for many years because of the influence of some of the great competitors that I was inspired by, influenced by, and learned from. Um, and so that's something you can throw onto the end of your routine as a little homage to them as well. Uh, so once again, I'm Jackson Rudolph. There are some tips to help you take your open circuit, open competition, traditional bow forms to the next level with some added difficulty. Make sure that you guys are tuning in to the Black Belt Magazine page as well for the Fight Back event to benefit several different uh, entities as well as the American Red Cross. So you definitely want to make sure you're checking out the Fight Back event. I will be teaching tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Central. Be sure you check that out. It's going to be an hour class. And in that one, we are going to be going over some weapons tricks and some, some, uh, some cool open weapons and creative bow staff releases, things like that. So be sure to check that out. Once again, it's on the Black Belt Magazine Facebook page. That's the Fight Back event. You definitely want to be a part of that. We'd be super honored if you were to donate there as well. I'm Jackson Rudolph. If you ever have any questions, always feel free to leave them in the comments below. And I'll see you guys next time. This has been another Technique Tuesday with Century Martial Arts.